Bibles to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. Amen. Matthew chapter 27. I love, uh, even more so now, when I was younger in college, uh, and when I say younger, I mean I wasn't much, 20, you know, 20, 18, you know, I act like I'm 30 up here. But, you know, in, in, not too long ago, I didn't preach every week, and, but I still love to preach. The more that I get to do this now, the more I fall in love with preaching and teaching the Word of God. But I always want to teach it so that you understand what God says. Amen. When we come to church, we want to know what God says. Amen. I don't get up here to try to teach to you my philosophy, my opinion. I want to give you what you know that God gives us from His Word that we can take it. Because when we live... We celebrate Easter because the Savior lives, amen. Jesus lives this morning, amen. He rose the third day from the grave, amen. There's some that will try to doubt and tell you that he didn't really raise from the dead or that and this and that, but Jesus is alive this morning, alive and well, amen. You go to Israel and there's a, there's a, a, a sign on the tomb that says he's not here, he is risen. And we serve a risen Savior. Now because of that, Jesus gave us the Word of God that we can use and we can study and apply to our lives to be better Christians. And so when we teach and preach the Word of God, when my goal when I teach and preach the Word of God is to teach you what God says that would help you to grow as a Christian. We, I could get up here and talk about politics. We, I could get up here and talk about everything under the sun. But that's not going to help you grow. What helps us grow as a Christian is the Word of God. Amen. And the more we know about God's Word, the more we learn, the Bible says, the more that we have an opportunity to grow. We want to be rooted in the Word of God. We want to know what the Word of God says because there are plenty of preachers out there that are lying to their people. They lie to the people of God. People that are hungry and searching for God are being lied to by plenty of preachers. And it's because they never get into God's Word. Amen. We're going to read the Bible this morning. We're going to study God's Word. I want you to look at God's Word for yourself and learn a truth. If you're a Christian this morning, born again, ask God to speak to you. Ask the Holy Spirit to teach you something that would help you to grow. If you're not saved this morning, if you don't know that if you died, you just, you're here and this is maybe new to you, then I ask you to listen as I give the Easter story in a different light, but yet... At the same time, give the Easter story for what it's meant to be. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're going to read Matthew chapter 27. Let's all stand. Matthew chapter 27. We're going to read verse number 1. We're going to start there. Matthew chapter 27, verse number 1. The Bible says, When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for to put them into the treasury because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore, that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord appointed me. And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered, Nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. Now at that feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. 
Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered, him, gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we sure do love you. Lord Jesus, thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you for dying on an old rugged cross. Thank you that we take this time. We take time throughout the year, Lord, to thank you. Lord, as I know I do, try every day, Lord, to thank you for dying for me and giving your life. But, Lord, we take a, Lord, a, a special time, Lord, to honor and, Lord, give reverence to what you've done for us, and Lord, and be thankful. Lord, I pray that this morning that the message would be a blessing, that it would help us, Lord, to grow, that it would help us, Lord, to... Learn more from the Word of God. Lord, if anybody here is not saved, may they trust you, Jesus, as their Savior today. Lord, we sure do love you. Thank you for all that you've done for us. We ask that you bless the message. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We're going to continue reading in verse 30. The Bible says, And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, when they heard that, said, This man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let it let be. Let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. 
And many women were there, beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, among which was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James, and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's children. When the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as ye can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to draw, dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angels answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay. Now I read that entire passage there because I know that there may be some that have never read the story of and not just and not that it's just a story but have never read how that Jesus died how that he gave his life there are four accounts in the Bible of the crucifixion of Jesus one in Matthew one in Mark one in Luke and one in John all four give a different light but we're going to read just from Matthew chapters 27 the Easter story is both a sad story and yet an exciting story. Exciting because we get to see how that Jesus gave his life so that we could be born again and have hope of eternal life. But sad to see how this comes about. Sad to see how that Jesus was first betrayed by a dear friend, Judas Iscariot, who had seen Jesus, walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, slapped Jesus in the face, so to speak, by giving Him a kiss and betraying our Lord and Savior. Jesus, not just that, but then He comes before Pilate and is condemned before government and before everybody, made to look as if He was a criminal. The God of heaven, a just man, he who was perfect, the Son of God, who stepped out into nothing and created everything, was made to seem like another malefactor, was made to be lower than those of normal society. He was made as low as it can be, condemned and tried before the court, and then killed. A death of such in the Roman Empire would put an, in, an indelible mark upon a name that can never be rid of. Whenever they think of a name of somebody that was crucified, it is always tied to their death, and it is put to shame. Jesus was given the lowest death that a man could die. Not just that, but we read of how he died on a cross in shame, naked before the world put to the lowest shame, and stripped of every dignity that ever a man could have. And then Pilate asks, what, what should I do? What, what can I do with this man Jesus? He's traded for a man named Barabbas. He's traded for a murderer. He's traded for a thief. And then they can't find anything to do with Jesus. How many people in today's society have traded Jesus for what they want? They've traded Jesus for their pleasure. They've traded Jesus for comfort. 
They've traded Jesus for their money or for their cars or for their job. And they, like Pilate, stand back and say, now what, what do I do with Jesus? Sad in America that we've traded Jesus for every other comfort and pleasure that we can afford. But when it comes to be in church, or when it comes to give honor to God, we somehow can't find room in our schedule. We somehow can't find room in our time, in our lives. So we just trade Him off. Jesus was mocked and ridiculed. He was lied about. You look there, verse 30, they spit upon Him. They took a reed, smote him on the head, took a crown of thorns. What a sad death. And then he was taken to Golgotha and there crucified, pierced in his hands and in his feet for a crime he never committed, died for a sin he never did, but he gave his life for you and I. We, like Barabbas, deserved to have been in that middle cross. We deserve to have been crucified. But instead of us being condemned and tried, it was Jesus Christ. I think it's sad that we would allow in America there to be people, denominations and religions that try to make Jesus less than what He was. He was the Son of God who was innocent and pure, and he was not guilty. Don't let anybody tell you that Jesus was less than God. Don't let anybody tell you that Jesus was less than innocent. He was the pure Lamb of God. But he did that for you and I. But what do we do? We thank him for that. I think there in verse 42 and 43 of Matthew 27. I think that they had it right. They did not realize it. The chief priests mocking him and the scribes and the elders were merely mocking Jesus. But they had it right and they didn't even know it. Verse 42, they said he saved others. That's what Jesus did. He saved others. He went to a cross so that he could save others. You realize you and I are the others. We're the others that he saved. He lost his life, gave his life, so that others could be saved. How much of our lives are spent as Christians helping to save others? We can help save others from this death of, and being spent eternity in hell by giving them the gospel. Jesus spent his life. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. As a Christian, I don't believe it is too much to ask. It's not too much of God to ask for you to go and tell others the gospel to try to help them be saved from an eternal hell. But then they also had it right in verse 43. They said, he trusted in God. Amen. Jesus trusted in God. He was God himself, but he submitted himself to God the Father. As we know the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, He submitted Himself to God the Father and died a death. He became sin for us. And He trusted in His Father, leaving us an example that we can trust in God. When all else seems to fail, when Jesus at the worst time in, in history still trusted that God would bring it out in the end. And amen. The victory was won, and we can be saved. In your life, you may come to a point where you feel it's the worst you've ever been in, the lowest you can ever go. You still trust in God. God will bring it to pass. God will take care of it. Amen. What a story. But I read the entire story because... I want to look at some examples. I want to look at some examples in the Easter story of people, in today, of people today. I find examples of what people are like today that were the same when Jesus went to the cross. 
And I'd like to show you even these people outside of church and even can be in church, in the house of God. But the closer you get to the cross, you'll find these people. Uh, if you want to give it a title, you can call it Easter's Examples. Easter's Examples. God gives us a, a story here that we can learn from and we can see what types of people gather around the cross. Number one, Matthew chapter 27, verse number three. We read it. We'll read it again. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. The closer you get to the cross, the, clo the more you'll realize there are deceivers. There are people that are deceiving. They look good on the outside, but they're not born again on the inside. Judas went to every church service Jesus ever preached. Judas went and went soul winning. He went out two by two when Jesus sent them out. Judas went to the prayer meetings. Judas got baptized. Judas even tithed. He handled the bag of money. But he was lost. It's possible to be in an old-fashioned, hellfire, brimstone, independent Baptist church and be deceiving in your salvation. Judas trusted in everything but the Lamb of God. He was around Jesus. He looked at Jesus. He shook Jesus' hand. He spoke to Jesus and yet still died and went to hell. He even kissed Jesus. He kissed the door of heaven and still died and went to hell. So close, but yet so far. In church it's possible for there to be people that deceive. Sometimes they deceive themselves. You say, you've been born again, but have you really trusted Jesus as your Savior? Being born again is not in the baptism. It's not in church. It's not in tithing. It's not in being here Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. It's not in all of the good things that you can do as in helping in the church, although we enjoy and we want you here. But true born again, true salvation is putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Do you know that you've done that? Are you deceiving yourself, thinking, I've been born again. I've had an experience with God. My friend, I didn't ask you for an experience. I asked you, have you been born again? Did you get saved? Did you have a point in time where you realized you were a sinner? You realized that you would have to spend eternity in hell, and you realized that Jesus was the only way to heaven, and you accepted that gift of eternal life, and you called upon Jesus and asked Him to save you? Many people look for a physical experience to have a, to have a spiritual salvation, as far as they think, well, I've been saved from a car wreck. That means I'm saved. Well, I've been saved from this or that. But my friend, there's only, salvation only comes from the Holy Spirit convicting you in the soul and telling you of your need of a Savior. Amen. There are deceivers. Have you deceived maybe even everybody else? Judas, they never expected Judas. The disciples, the friends that he knew, the people he were with, never one time would have looked at Judas and thought that it was him. They all asked, is it I? Is it me? And I believe that in a church it can be possible for somebody to so deceive that we don't even know. But so sad that you can be around the gospel. So sad that you can hear the word of God. So sad that you can be pointed to Jesus and still miss it. So sad that you would be happy living that way. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Because just because we may not see, God does. You may fool everybody else, but you don't fool God. You can deceive everybody even the pastor, in claiming, I've been born again. But you and God know. Amen. You and God know when you trusted Christ.
You and God know when you're, that you're lying. Judas could look at Jesus and know. And that's what's crazy to me. Jesus was the Son of God. He knew. He knew, and Judas could look at him and know that Jesus knew that he was not saved. Yet he would still be around him. He would see the miracles. He would see the compassion that Jesus had. But yet, in verse 48, now, that he, now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same as he, hold him fast. Judas betrayed Jesus to the point that he would give, a, he would, he would give him, a, a, in the Bible days, they would kiss each other on the cheeks. Now, I'm not going to kiss anybody here, amen, except my wife. But in the Bible days, it's like we shake hands. It's like we give each other a hug. Judas was so okay with betraying Jesus that he would use a term of endearment. He would kiss him to betray him. Amen. The closer you come to the cross, the more you'll find there are deceivers. We must take a self-inspection and make sure we're born again and we've accepted Jesus as our Savior. Amen. Salvation is not through your work for Christ. It's by the work of Christ. He's already paid for sin. Amen. Just trust Him. Now let's turn the second people near the cross. Matthew chapter 26, verse 75. Matthew chapter 26, verse 75. You look there and it says, And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. There are backsliders near the cross. Yes, you're born again. Yes, you're saved, but you know that you're not what you should be. I believe all of us here have come to a point like that. We backslide a little bit. We slack off in our work for God. Peter, here in this story, in, the, in this chapter, that Peter, he had followed Jesus, but he denied that he even knew the Son of God. In the work of the Lord, there are going to be those that will backslide so much, they'll get so far from God that they'll even deny they know Him. He was in the old world and he, uh, Peter was at the sinner's fire and he had the hope of eternal life. Jesus was going to the cross to pay for sin and instead of pointing people to Jesus, he denied that he ever even knew Him. There'll be people in church that will so backslide they know they have the hope of eternal life, and instead of giving the hope of the gospel, they'll deny that they ever even knew that Jesus died. They'll deny they ever knew the Savior. Don't get to that point. Don't backslide so much that you would deny Him in front of your friends or deny God in front of your family. Of course, we know that Peter looked at Jesus, and Jesus knew what he'd done. Funny how that even though Jesus knew Peter would deny him, Peter still, or Jesus still went to the cross for Peter. Hey Amen. If you're backslidden today, or maybe you've contemplated backsliding, you've contemplated leaving church, you've contemplated uh, not doing as much for God, you've contemplated giving up and falling back a little bit, know that Jesus still loves you this morning. Amen. Jesus looked at Peter. It hurt the Lord but he still was willing to forgive Peter. Amen. It hurts God when we backslide. It hurts God when we say no to God and we don't do as much when we know that we should. But God's still willing to forgive. Romans 5, 8, But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Don't backslide this morning. Don't get away from God. Amen. Also, the no another near the cross. Matthew chapter 27, verse number 57. There are those that will deceive. There are those that will backslide. Matthew 27, verse 57. The Bible says, When the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered, and when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean, a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, 
which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. There are some that the closer you get to the cross, the cross compels them to do more for God. There are some that when they see Jesus on the cross and they read about it and they see what Jesus has done and the sacrifice that he gave, it compels them to do more and to give everything to God. Joseph laid Jesus in his own new tomb. A rich man, wealthy, gave everything he had because he loved his Savior. Amen. Would this be that every Christian in the room would get to a point where they so love God that the cross compels them to do more and more and give for the Lord Jesus Christ? Some will backslide. Some, are deceit, some will deceive. But would to God everybody today let the cross of Christ compel you to want to do more for a risen Savior? Would it compel you to give more? Joseph gave his own new tomb. He didn't give what he borrowed. He didn't give what's been used. He didn't give maybe what he had. He gave what was new. He gave him everything he had. Lots of times we like to give God the leftovers of our life. We as servants, as Christians, we like to give God what's left. We take what we want, we use our time, and then we give God what's left in our day. Instead of reading our Bible and setting time aside each day to walk with God, we use our time for what we want, and then at the end of the day, if we have time, we'll give some to God. We'll come to church Sunday morning, but we won't come back Sunday night because we don't have time for God. We have time for ourselves. May the cross today, as you read and I read, how that Jesus gave his life. It ought to compel you. It ought to drive you to say, Jesus would do that for me. How much is too much to give to the Savior? Some of you look at me this morning and think, you're crazy. You're right. But I'm crazy because of Jesus. Boy, I'm saved this morning. Born again. I have a home in heaven. Jesus went to the cross and we celebrate Easter because he went and died and gave his life. There's not too much that Jesus could ask me to do. There's not too much that Jesus could ask me to give. God wants me to give my life for him, pastoring the rest of my life, then I'll die in Wichita, Kansas. Amen. If God calls me somewhere else, God does. But my life is for the Lord because the cross compels me. Sad if you can read the Bible. Sad when you can read what Jesus did. Sad when you can know and look at a cross and know what Jesus did for you and not be convicted in your soul that you don't do more for God. That's where we would be backslidden. We get backslidden when we're that way. Amen? Let's be compelled to do more. Matthew 28, verse 17. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. There are some, the closer you get to the cross, that will doubt. They'll doubt God. They'll doubt what God can do. They'll doubt what Jesus has done. They'll doubt that God can save or that God can take care of. And they'll doubt the work of God. We have to move on. Amen. Thomas, as we know, is called Doubting Thomas. He doubted God. There are some that probably doubt Jesus. They doubt their salvation, maybe. But that's because you've got to get in God's Word and get closer to Jesus. Man, the farther you get from Jesus, the more you'll begin to doubt. Draw nigh to God and He'll draw nigh to you. But there will be some that will live a life of doubt. They'll live the rest of their lives doubting God. Somebody that doubts, somebody that questions God is somebody that lives a life, or he's somebody that lives with a, a life with a lack of faith. Because faith is the opposite of doubt. When you have faith in God, it means you trust Him. 
When you have no faith, you doubt him. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. This is what Thomas did. He got away from Jesus. He got away from the word of God. And he began to doubt. The farther you get in your life from this blessed old book is the farther you get away from faith and from truth. The farther you take your children away from the Bible, the more they'll doubt what God can do. That's why this generation is so sick. This generation is sick with a, with a lack of faith because we've taken the Word of God away from our children. We've taken God out of the public schools. We've taken prayer out of the public school. We've taken Bible reading. Sure, they can go and, and have, the, have the Koran and they can have anything else, but when it comes to a blessed old black book, they're looked upon with scorn and they wonder why we have problems because there's a lack of faith. This world's full of doubt. The farther you take your family from the Word of God, the more your family will begin to doubt God. And they'll begin to doubt what God can do. You'll have children that'll grow up and won't get saved because they'll doubt God. You'll have children that'll grow up and won't live for God because they'll doubt God. We have to keep our families in the Word of God. Keep our families in church. Keep our families around the house of God and around the Word and keep us in prayer so that we don't doubt. But there are some that will live that way. Don't live a life of doubt. Live a life of faith. Doubt is the opposite of faith. If you begin to doubt God, that means you need more faith. That means get in the Word of God. And allow God to speak to you and increase your faith. Matthew 27, verse 54. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. The closer you get to the cross, the more you'll find there are those that will get saved. There are those that will be born again. You can't help but lift up the cross and lift up Jesus without somebody wanting to be saved. Man, we were out yesterday. I got a chance to do some visiting. I got here late because of work, and I had to work late, and then I, had, and then I forgot the palm leaves in Hutchinson, so my brother drove me and met me halfway, and it was just a mess. Finally, we got to go soul winning. Finally, I got to just hand out a few tracks and invite people to church for the Easter service. Met a young man, he'd come out with a Wii remote. What? And he was playing the Wii. Don't interrupt somebody playing the Wii now. Like, man, he was mad. He's like, hey, I'm playing... Oh, a Super Smash Brothers or something, I think it was like that. I was like, what in the world? His name was Ishmael. I said, Ishmael, I'd just like to invite you to church. He said, oh, you know, I, I'd like to go to church. He's like, I've been looking for a church. I said, great. And I said, Ishmael, I said, but more important, I said, I wouldn't be much of a pastor if I didn't ask you. You know if you die that you would go to heaven? Do you know that you're born again? He goes, no. I was kind of shocked. Normally, most people say, well, yeah, you know. He just, no. I said, well, Ishmael, I said, if I could show you how you could go to heaven, what would you say? He goes, well, I'd like to know. Amen. And I got to show him how to be saved. Now the devil was fighting because he had a little nine-month-old. She kept trying to crawl out the door. He would take his foot and he'd go. He'd lift her up on his foot and take her and put her back over here. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there leading him, to the, leading him to the Lord. I've got the screen door behind. Uh, or He's holding the screen door. It's like right here. And his little nine-month-old, she keeps trying to crawl out. And he takes his foot, puts it underneath her. He's a big big guy he's huge and he just takes his foot does like that moves her over puts her down she comes back moves her over put her down i was like devil i'm gonna smack you he was trying to distract him but ishmael got saved Amen. but it reminded me again that you can't lift up the cross too much without somebody wanting to be saved there may be many that reject christ there may be many like in the story here where they will mock jesus call him what he's not There'll be many that get bored with church. They'll get bored with being in the house of God. But there'll be somebody that will one day walk down the aisle and beg to be saved. Amen. 
Boy, you listen to me. You get in church long enough, you'll see people when the Word of God is preached, because the Bible says the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. You preach the Word of God long enough, somebody's going to get saved. Somebody's life's going to get changed. You go out in this wicked old world, you hand out a tract, invite somebody to church, do something for God, I promise you somebody will get saved. Well, we get tired and we think nobody will get saved. Nobody wants to listen. You keep going. You keep going because there's a soldier out there that's watching that will say, truly, this was the Son of God. Pilate denied Christ. Pilate pushed Jesus away. But a soldier standing at the feet of Jesus saw the light and said, truly, this was the Son of God. Boy, I'll bet you that soldier got a kick out of it. When three days later, he hears Jesus came back from the dead. He thought, boy, truly this is. Because he says this was. Jesus died. Jesus gave his life. He died. The soldier did not know that Jesus had promised to raise from the dead. But I believe he knew it was the Son of God. And I'll bet he got a kick out of it. Knowing Jesus came back and he said, truly, he is the Son of God. But people will get saved. You keep preaching. You keep going out. You hand out those gospel tracts. You keep giving the gospel. And I promise you somebody will get saved. Amen. Don't ever get tired of giving the gospel. Don't ever get tired of going out and preaching the word of God. I read uh, a couple weeks ago of a missionary that they went and, he, uh, and him and his family, they left and went, uh, I can't remember the, the name of the place, but there was where there was uh, the barbarians and the gospel had never been preached and the cannibals. And he had such a heart for the people. He served 20 years and there was an island not far and God burdened his heart to go and preach the gospel to them. He'd been warned not to go. So he left one day. Him and a friend, the captain on the boat, waited, and they went in a boat off to the island. The captain said a few moments later he saw the bank as it began to fill with the cannibals and it began to fill with the, the people of the island. And they began to get in a boat and come towards him. He didn't see signs of the missionaries. And I remember reading how that the cannibals, they went back later and they, uh, or the, the, the missionaries went back to go find their friends back later and they gathered what they could. The cannibals had killed them. And I thought how they gave their life. Now, not long after that, somebody went back and gave them the gospel and many of them got saved. But somebody was willing to give their life so that somebody could just hear the gospel. Boy, we sit in church in America and have the word of God. And we can't even hand out a gospel tract. There are those that give their lives just so somebody could hear that there's hope. We can't even hand out a tract. May the cross compel you to be a soul winner, to give the gospel wherever you go. Don't be like the Pharisees. Don't be like the Sadducees who mock God. There are some that are the mockers today. This is the last thing and will be done. There are some that are mockers. There are some that will sit in church. They'll hear the word of God. They'll hear the message. They'll hear what Jesus has done. And they'll mock God. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. You can sit here and mock the church. You can mock the house of God. You can mock the preacher. But you remember God's not mocked. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Get busy serving God. Don't mock Him. Because God will come. You may think everything's okay. And you can mock God like the rest of the world. But payday's coming. God's not mocked this morning. God knows your heart. You can mock Him. But God is going to come and take, down, take vengeance. The Pharisees said, if, you can, if He be the King of Israel, let Him come down from the cross 
and we will believe him. They said, let him deliver him now if he will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. But what they didn't know is that Jesus is going to come back one day, split that eastern sky, and they are going to stand before the Almighty Judge. He didn't come down from the cross because he had a work to finish, but one day you and I will stand before him and we'll be judged. There won't be any mocking of God then. The Bible says, Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Can I ask you, are you born again today? Where are you in the Easter story? Are you backslidden like Peter? Do you find yourself doubting like Thomas? Do you find yourself being compelled like Joseph to do more? Do you find yourself being a deceiver like Judas and maybe you've made people think what you're not? Or do you find yourself being like that soldier that sits at the feet and says, truly, he is the Son of God? Or are you born again? You realize there's two places people go when they die. You either spend eternity in heaven or you spend eternity in hell. What makes the difference is not how close to the cross you are, but whether or not you trust what Jesus did on the cross for you. There are hundreds of people that stood within 50 feet of the cross of Christ and will spend eternity away from God. You can be as close to God as you want, but until you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, heaven is never, will never be your home. I beg you today, if you find yourself like that soldier, that you see the Easter story and you see what Jesus did on the cross and how he, was, and how he rose from the dead, and you'd say, truly, He is the Son of God. That's what Jesus wants this morning. He wants you to be born again. If, you're, if you are born again, then Jesus wants us to be like Joseph, to be compelled to do more. Be compelled to do more for God. Do more for the work of God. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we sure do love you.